Welcome, everybody. It is Friday, February 16th. We have another great episode here in store for you on the Florida EMS webinar. Obviously, this is from the Florida chapter of the NAMSP, which is um, alive and strong and, and very active, and we're really grateful for that. Each and every week, we bring you incredible speakers, authors from around the country uh, and really around the world. So uh, this week is no different. Uh, we have Dr. Kajal Jain, who is a very accomplished a physician. She's a professor of anesthesia and critical care in the northern part of India. She'll, she'll orient you shortly to the uh, to exactly where she's located. Um, what I, I um, uh, you know, I connected with her on Twitter. She um, just released a paper not too long ago on a topic that I love, and I think more people need to hear about. It started with you know the Scott Weingard and Jeff Jarvis. Uh, talking about uh, DSI uh, over RSI. And uh, this is another great study that goes along to that topic. So Dr. Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. Please make any further introduction and then you can go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to be with you all today and uh, all the way from India. And if you like, if you just let me share my screen, I will briefly show you from where I am. Uh, can right. I share the screen now? Yeah, yeah it's, all, it's all yours, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's... So as I've been already introduced, I'm uh, Dr. Kajal Jain and I'm from uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research. And uh, uh, just to show you from where I've come briefly, this is Chandigarh and it is in the north of India, quite high up. It's a very well-planned city and uh, you can see that and it's been um, planned by a French architect uh, Lee Kabuze. and this below figure it just shows you shows you one uh, heritage pa park over here which has been made out of waste materials and this is a hallmark of Chandigarh whenever you visit Chandigarh this is a must go and see place this is called uh, Nek Chan's Rock Garden so and this is my institute for where I work this is a tertiary care center and it's a big academic center which caters to the whole of northern India and this building, which you can see, is the exclusive standalone trauma center, which is approximately 200 bedded with five theaters and 14 bedded ICU running round the clock. All facilities which cater to level one trauma center happen here. So with this, uh, I would uh, come to our topic of today. And as we all know that endotracheal intubation is a very high risk procedure, uh, which is uh, when performed in emergency situations, critical cares or pre-hospital setting. And it's very much different from the ones which we do in our operating rooms. And we know the reasons why. This has been elegantly studied in this intube study in uh, JAMA 2021, where they showed many peri-intubation adverse events out of which uh, re to relevance to me was this severe hypoxia which, uh, with an incidence of 9.3%. And this stands to a lot of importance in the setting of trauma patients where severe hypoxia leads to secondary damage and then adverse outcomes. So uh, how do we approach these patients who are at risk of hypoxia, hypotension and cardiac arrest? We all know the, the approaches are very simple. The traditional one which we are taught in the operating room is that you oxygenate the patient and then put a induction agent continue with oxygenation when the patient is getting further you know induced then you go ahead with paralysis and then you intubate but when we talk about rapid sequence induction this is mostly done when you want to prevent the aspiration risk here you break it down you like pre-oxygenate the patient and then you co-administer sedation with paralysis and then you intubate. We are all aware of it. Just to revise it, I am saying all this again. And when we talk about delayed sequence intubation, this has been particularly useful in those patients who are agitated, they are thrashing around and they rip off the mask. Basically, you fail to oxygenate them in emergency situation. Then how do you take control of this? So it was, uh, it was uh, opined that if you sedate these patients with a dissociative dose of ketamine, they become calm and then you can oxygenate them. And if the patient requires tube, you can go ahead with paralysis. In, and in certain situations, it was also found that there was uh, the patient became, you know, um, better with respiration and 
did not require intubation so those patients were awakened and you know the the situation was averted the intubation was averted so basically it was thought that this uh, this delayed sequence intubation is actually a step ahead it's a procedural sedation for the procedure of pre oxygenation by giving a lower dose of ketamine and dissociating the patient from the environment so this was elegantly studied by dr scott wingard which really intrigued me because i read his article which was published in 2011 in which he talked about pre oxygenation re oxygenation and delayed sequence intubation in emergency department he basically had this background in mind that the goal of pre oxygenation is to provide us with a safe buffer time before desaturation during an emergency intubation however some patients are unable to achieve adequate saturations by conventional means and here therefore they are at risk of desaturation during apnea and laryngoscopy so he he opined that in such patients if you administer ketamine in a low dose as a slow iv push then patient becomes dissociated then you can place a non rebreather mask or nav and once the patient has reached a saturation which is in the safe zone that is more than 95% then you can allow them to breathe for another 3 minutes and administer a paralytic agent leave the mask in place till paralytic agent has taken its full effect and then intubate so this was very interesting because um, this gave a you know a, a higher first pass success rate without hypoxia so at the end of it i i uh, dr wengard suggested that these techniques like niv as pre oxygenation technique or uh, ventilator in emergency as a better bag wall mask device and breaking the sequence of rsi using the concept of delayed sequence intubation may make peri intubation periods safer so for this he did one observational study which i read long time back in which he questioned whether dsi is a safe and effective alternative to rsi in patients who cannot be adequately pre oxygenated and he from his reports uh, which were with the which was uh, enrolling 64 patients uh, in a multi centric trial they found that in altered mental status if you do dissociation with ketamine it allows pre oxygenation with non rebreather mask and nippv and therefore his the primary outcome that is the difference in oxygen saturation after maximal attempts at pre oxygenation before dsi is done compared with saturations just before intubations showed a benefit so the benefits you can see in this graph these blue dots actually indicate the oxygen levels before dsi uh, sorry uh, the, these are the after dsi and these are the ones on i am saying the wrong thing these are the ones before dsi and these are the ones after dsi so he, he used a mean dose of ketamine which was quite low 1.4 mg per kg in maximum number of patients and uh, these the indications of intubations were primarily the same as we see in emergency settings but more important is to note that the the saturations increased from a mean of 89.9% before delayed sequence intubation to 98.8% afterwards with an increase of 8.9% so with a big confidence interval of 6.4% to 10.9% however uh, the drawbacks of this study were that this was an observational trial and i felt that uh, in in trauma patients with altered mental status uh, and those who are obtunded the use of nippv uh, would not be possible for these two reasons um, i i got the idea that i need some more evidence and maybe i can also plan a study in my center which is a high volume center where a lot of trauma patients come and we have to do uh, daily 6 to 8 intubations for these critically injured so uh, this trial was published in anesthesia analgesia in may 2023 uh, with this citation and we enrolled adult trauma patients uh, uh, who came to a trauma emergency and required definitive air with endotracheal intubation and they were randomized to receive either the traditional rsi or dsi using ketamine 
and exclusion criteria inclu included patients with anticipated difficult airway extensive burns those who were actively vomiting or there were crash intubations of patient had had a cardiac arrest or uh, uh, unanticipated difficult airway encountered during the study so uh, as i've already said that we in the in the rsi group we did the traditional pre oxygenation and uh, uh, drug administration as i had already alluded to before but we used bain circuit uh, for oxygenation at 10 liters per minute and we used direct laryngoscopy in both the groups uh, and confirmation of intubation was done by bilateral chest auscultation or chest rise and missed in the endotracheal tube we observed heart rate nibp saturations at baseline and then at each minute interval for 3 minutes during pre oxygenation and 1 minute following intubation so our primary outcome was that we observed incidence of peri intubation hypoxia that is saturation of less than 93% any time from pre oxygenation until 1 minute after intubation also along with this as secondary outcomes we observed the cormac lehan grading first pass success rate at intubation airway injuries and use of adjuncts like bougie or oropharyngeal airways so we calculated the sample size looking at the incidence of peri intubation hypoxia which is reported to be around 57% in trauma patients and assuming a 20% absolute reduction in the incidence of peri intubation hypoxia in the dsi compared to rsi we uh, required 96 seven patients for each group so this is the consort statement in uh, which we have seen that some intubations were done out of hospital and in trauma triad some intubations were done by the emergency residents so we had 236 which were randomized for rsi or dsi and uh, the total analysis was done for 200 patients as we excluded 12 patients in uh, DSI and twenty four in uh, RSI for the unanticipated difficult intubation after randomization. So, as the results showed that the baseline saturations were low for both the groups. However, at uh, one minute, uh, we saw in DSI group the saturations were significantly more than RSI group, and uh, so were they at two and three minutes. And at uh, at one minute after intubation, they were. comparable so the overall incidence of peri intubation hypoxia was 8% in dsi group whereas in rsi it was higher that is 35% so this is the box and whisker plot showing the same thing the baseline saturations uh, the blue one is dsi group whereas uh, the red one, the orange one is rsi and you can see how the dsi group is faring well with the oxygen saturation uh, at uh, at 1 2 and 3 minutes and then 1 minute post intubation for the secondary outcomes we also observed that the first pass success rates were better in dsi group than in rsi group uh, that is 83 versus 69% whereas the cl grading and airway injuries and use of airway adjuncts were comparable in both the groups so however this study had certain limitations like the study was conducted on patients with structurally normal airways and um, due to the low resources in my country we are not able to measure antidal oxygen or antidal carbon dioxide we used clinical methods to determine our um, intubation uh, uh, to check our intubation um, in the trachea and intubating anesthesiologist uh, were in the second year of training because that is the typical way our hospital goes it's always a second year trainee resident who does the periphery intubation calls but they have had certain significant experience in the operating room or for operating these patients and another thing which we can add is that at that point of time in 2019 in our uh, emergency triage we did not have the use of video laryngoscope so all the intubations were done using direct laryngoscope so at the conclusion i would say that delayed sequence intubation significantly decreases peri intubation hypoxia compared to rapid sequence intubation but uh, whether we will be able to use it in future it stands the test of time and some more data may be and with this uh, i will uh, thank my authors this is the anju anjishnu jit bandopadhyay this is dr pankaj kumar and this is dr anudeep jafra dr hanish thakur and then uh, the, myself you are already seeing 
So thank you very much. I'm Amazing. ready for questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Amazing presentation. Great timing. I see one can of your co-authors. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can stop the share, yeah. Um, I yeah, see one I, of your co-authors is there. Oh, go, go ahead, Paul. You want to make a comment? Well, I just want to know what kind of bird that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. No, good job. Thank you very much, uh, but I'll let you go. And then you, you're introducing a co-author there. Yeah, I see uh, uh, Dr. Pankaj Kumar is on. Thank you for joining us as well. Do you want to, do you want to make any comments before we get to the questions? Uh, Pankaj, you can uh, just uh, um, you can switch on your video and you can say hello, and you can tell your he is the resident who has intubated all the patients. <laughs> he is the he is the Hi. person who has done all the intubations. So, uh, Pankaj, you want to share any um, any experience of yours while you were in the triage? Hello, everyone. Did you Hi. enjoy your thesis? Yeah, definitely. It was a great experience to be uh, doing that thesis under the elite guidance of yours. And now I really thankful for everyone to having me here with you. Excellent. Well, we, we appreciate it. Uh, clearly, you, you're getting great mentorship. Uh, that was a very well done study and uh, looking forward to some of the questions. Um, and I, I'll, I'll start, which is, you talked about the Weingart paper, which was all the way back in 2011, another one in 2014. Jeff Jarvis published um, several years ago, too, specifically in EMS. Now you have a publication. It's very clear that DSI is safer and more effective than RSI. Why is it that most of the U.S., the US you know, both EMS and hospital, uh, and maybe you can describe if anyone else is doing DSI in India, why is it that people are having a hard time converting over to DSI? If it's that good. Yeah, because uh, I feel uh, rapid sequence induction has been the gold standard over many, many years. And um, uh, people are not very uh, knowledgeable about delayed sequence intubation. I myself, although the papers are very old, it, the first paper came in 2011, then 2014, and then Dr. Jarvis, he published in 2015, but I I read them in 2019. So like we are very, uh, you know, way behind in reading the literature because uh, not much work has been done on it. But now since it's coming up, uh, some of my colleagues in uh, another institute, which is also of national importance in Delhi, uh, they have uh, in emergency medicine, they have started uh, doing it in their center. So, and we have also started conducting like more studies using delayed sequence intubation um, in anticipated difficult airways now. And I think if we have more data, then it will become more convincing once we have more um, meta-analysis and systematic reviews to suggest that yes, peri-intubation hypoxia is decreased using this technique, um, especially in trauma settings where patients are agitated, they are having so much of pain because they are traumatized, they have fracture femur, they have fracture ribs, and ketamine helps a lot in alleviating that pain, which uh, propofol doesn't do. Uh, so I think it will have uh, some role to play in the future for sure, but we have more data. Awesome. And as, as we're waiting for, for other questions, I, I have um, a little curveball to throw you. You know, we've been doing DSI at my agencies since 2019, very successfully. Um, and what I've what I added into the protocol was the ability to, in certain cases, not use a paralytic. For example, the severe asthmatic, if you take away their negative pressure, their respiratory drive, uh, they end up having uh, a peri-intubation cardiac arrest. Um, and we're, we're planning on publishing our data. But do you have any experience with? giving the ketamine and either aborting the intubation altogether or not utilizing the paralytic, uh, you know, in, in any patient moving, moving past the ketamine. Any comments on those two items? Uh, definitely. If, if we do avoid paralytics in certain groups. But for this patient, since the protocol, this study, the protocol dictated that we use it, we used it. But otherwise, in my center, there are patients who are obtained significantly, say they have got a very low GCS, they are like uh, just about 4 GCS or 5 GCS, 
in in those cases my residents do avoid uh, using paralytics they do it with simple ketamine or propofol also but they don't use delayed sequence in those cases because right. um, uh, they are not very used to it and i do give a class before they start their periphery posting that they should use this technique but definitely we do it without paralysis also and and i know and i'm going to bring in dr lee in a minute i know that there are people who are against that just to kind of be very open about that uh, dr jarvis being one of them saying that there's more complications as it relates to a ketamine only uh, uh intubation uh, so thank you for that. Let me bring in the one and only Dr. Wayne Lee. Wayne, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Jane. Uh, very, very nice study. I appreciate it. I don't think this has much to do with um, with uh, the study, but I was curious. I didn't understand why you weren't able to use entitled CO2. In, uh, in, in our hospital, uh, the emergency triage has the facility for monitoring only ECG, NIBP and pulse oximetry. It's not upgraded to use uh, carbon uh, entitled carbon dioxide in trauma triage. In our ICUs and operation theaters, we are fully equipped, but somehow in um, um, in the monitoring is slightly, you know, uh, not up to the mark in triage. Interesting. That's a great question. So even the there are there are the uh, end tidal CO twos that are portable. You could just you could just put them in line into the ET tube. Even even those are not available. Interesting. No, they are available, but there is you know the uh, we are graduating. You know, if I tell you how raw we were a couple of years back, and I have done another study in twenty sixteen when uh, I found out that most of the intubations were being done using. Uh, you know, injudiciously benzodiazepines, some 15, 20, because there were so many airway complications once patients were coming to us in theater or in uh, ICUs. So from there on, I started doing my series of studies and then I started putting the monitors over there because we are we are not a very well set, well gelled system of, um, you know, receiving patients in our hospitals. We are still, um, you know, we are working ahead on those lines. Um, Excellent. So, and maybe in the next uh, purchase grant, we will get those entitled carbon dioxide because now I am uh, very strongly going ahead, uh, you know, with the with the administration that I want those entitled carbon dioxide monitors as well. So I'm sure Great. we'll get them. Great. Well, uh, your, your leadership sounds like it's, uh, it's it's making a lot of impact. So thank you. Let me bring in Dr. Tom DiBernardo. I'm calling you Dr. Chief Tom DiBernardo. Uh, I know that you're working very hard at the state with biospatial, many of us have, um, have 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 seen our data. Would you mind coming on real quick and letting at least the Florida people know what the biospatial fair nineteen measures, Chief? The the lecture was just so on point as we released the uh, state plan measures. Fair airway measure nineteen all is available to all EMS agencies in Florida that monitors the peri intubation period for oxygenation, proper oxygenation, so you don't cause the desaturation, uh, pre and post intubation within five minutes. Uh, I like your graduated scale, so I think our five minutes is even more liberal, but I, I, I'm okay with that now that I saw your data there. I felt pretty good about that, but I just want uh, the folks to know to study the peri intubation period in Florida, making sure that you uh, prepare the patient before your intubation so you don't crash them is fair airway 19, and uh, that we need to uh, do a lot of work on that measure in, in some areas. So it's a good measure to use and feel free to call me and I'll help you uh, craft it on your screen. I can't wait to, uh, to log on to biospatial to see our data. Uh, you know, we, we put a lot of work into it, Tom, and I, I appreciate the fact that you've given us these dashboards. So thank you for that. And if anyone in Florida wants to know how to get onto biospatial, uh, we've done a few tutorials, but either hit me up or hit Tom up uh, for a password, you need to hit Tama. Uh, let's bring in Dr. Marv Wayne. Dr. Wayne, you want to make your comment? Well, I tried to make it in the uh, in the chat, but a couple of important points here. Number one, the process of intubating an asthmatic should be taught as a last resort, not a first resort. It's the right. fastest way to kill an asthmatic or somebody with profound uh, lung disease, COPD. Um, <clears throat> they get the tube and they often go down the tube. Um, so we use a progression of care 
for our sick asthmatics, of which the third or fourth step, however you wish to look at it, is ketamine. The ketamine, on, in most cases, allows us to then adequately ventilate and oxygenate. Remember, we had a two-stage process here, especially with the asthmatics. We get air in very easily. It's getting it out that's the problem. Um, and that we don't have to go on to the process of putting plastic in the airway. And I think if you take that approach and you get to that point of disaster, as I call it, we really think you must um, put the tube in. Uh, you've at least done an excellent job of delayed sequence and maximizing the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, oxygenation. Because the minute you stop and give the paralytic that little bit of oxygenation you've got is going to disappear. And then, as I said, most of the time, you, can, you, you don't need that. The other thing that we've started doing more is using um, a, a CPAP uh, on our asthmatics after we give them ketamine and other patients in whom we're pre-oxygenating as, again, a stage process. Now, we're very fortunate in America. We know we have video laryngoscopy for, we've been doing it for 18 years. We've got all kinds of monitors, you know, whistles and bells. But I have done work in Asia and other third uh, world nations. I hate to use that term, low resource nations. I like that term. Um, and uh, I think we all are spoiled. And your work definitely shows us that you can do excellent work in nations that have limited resources. So thank you for bringing this up today. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Marv. Um, so my, my question here for the group is, you know, here we, we mentioned it and Dr. Jane, you know, very nicely laid it out for us that this has been around since 2011. What, what will be the tipping point? What is it going to take for people to actually change their practice? Is it going to be looking at their data? For example, what biospatial fair 19 is going to do. Is it going to take a larger RCT? Um, I think that the EMS community is much further ahead in the U.S. than in the uh, hospital community. Whenever I bring up, and I actually gave a talk on DSI to some hospital folks, a big group, 200 people, and it was almost like I had three eyeballs and four heads. They couldn't believe that I was even daring, daring to change this concept from uh, RSI to DSI. So, Dr. Jane, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it over to you to give us a final comment about what your thoughts are on that. Again, thank you for joining us. And we really appreciated all the work that you've done and you, you had a great presentation. Thank you so much for uh, your kind words. And I again feel that um, uh, we should think about using ketamine first for those patients who are agitated, who are thrashing around because uh, we lose so much time in putting back their masks and then ventilating them and then causing, uh, you know, vomiting and aspiration. I think it will be a great idea to start using dissociative dose of ketamine and maybe we can work further ahead on defining the doses and you and seeing how good they fare in different comorbidities like you're talking about asthma. Similarly, in difficult airways, say we have soiled airways or we have a burnt airway, whether these are going to be useful in those situations also. Because what, what we have studied is in normal airways. I think we should study it further because we did not find any adverse event in uh, those 200 patients. And another 200 which I've studied, but I'm yet to you know um, screen that data once again. So I'm finding it useful. Excellent. Very wise words. And again, we really thank you so much for joining us. This will this talk will be on YouTube. Um, I believe this is this may be the hundred fiftieth talk we've had. Uh, we've had incredible speakers uh, next week and the week after. We have some great speakers lined up as well. So please send out the email to your friends uh, and join us every single week. Um, please stick around and join uh, the Eagles webinar, which is about to get started. Dr. Pepe runs the International Consortium uh, of Medical Directors. You can click on the Zoom link and pop on over. And Dr. Pepe, we will see you in about 30 seconds. So I'll stick around and uh, we'll see you on the other side, my friend. 1130. Perfect that's timing. Like, that's like a half a minute. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> Bye-bye. You got it. And Kelly, the activity code is right above you. CME is 19369. And then for Eagle, it's 19368. Um, and again, if you have any questions, let me know. 
Uh, good to see everybody. Dr. Jane, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please, so much. please join us. Uh, I know it's late, but feel free to join us every week. And when, when you have your, your other papers come out, please let me know. We'll have you right back on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'd love, I invite you all to India for our meetings. It would be good well, to have you. The city looks beautiful. And so uh, it's my dream. It's a bucket list thing for me to come. So I would Definitely. love to do that. We look forward to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Dr. Much. Kumar, nice to meet you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So Thank everyone so can much. join. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody can join uh, using the link in the chat. So open up your chat, everybody. Look in the link. Uh, it says link to join Eagles webinar. And everyone can just, if you click on that link, it'll take you right over to Dr. Pepe's webinar. And we'll see you guys on the other side. If anyone's having any issues, just let me know.